This is a time, we are at a certain time in history where maximum amount of intellectual activity is happening. Or in other words, maximum number of people are beginning to think for themselves. There was a time in one village, only one person was thinking for everybody, others just took instructions from him. But a time has come when every individual is becoming capable of thinking for himself. Once so much intellectual capability comes, when people ask for well-being, you pointing upward is not going to work. Your well-being is up there, is not going to work. It's beginning to happen. So a lot of people are looking outward. By looking upward in the world, many people have become hallucinatory, many wars have been fought in incredible amount of cruelty has been imported on each other because people are looking up. Now people have started looking out for their well-being. Now in pursuit of human well-being, we are ripping the planet apart. This whole so-called environmental degradation is just the result of pursuit of human well-being. Hundred years ago, where we were, and where we are today in terms of our comfort and convenience, it's not even imaginable. We are the most comfortable generation ever, do you agree with me? Hello? We are the most comfortable generation ever, but can we claim that we are the most joyful generation ever, peaceful generation ever? Do we know really well-being? This is because Samskriti, some, the word Sanskriti is to be, today being used as synonymous with culture, but what Sanskriti means is, sam means equanimous, sam also means exuberant. Kriti means to do, to do life in an equanimous and an exuberant way. The problem right now with most people is, if they're equanimous, there is no exuberance, if they're exuberance, there is no balance within themselves. I always see, if I tell people, uh, <clears throat> be intense, they will become tense. <laughs> if you tell them relax, they will become lax. In laxity there is no life, in tension there is no life. Intensity and relaxation is life. Life will happen at its peak if you know how to be intense and relaxed at the same time, equanimity and exuberance at the same time, this is Sanskriti. So this is our Sanskriti, how to become equanimous and exuberant at the same time. I think very proudly the chief minister was referring to the tribal people, though they are poor, how they are living, I don't get all the words, but uh, <laughs> I get the spirit behind that. How they are living with great pride and joy, Though they are living in very rudimentary accommodations, no so-called modern amenities and luxuries, but life is full. Only thing we need to take care of is basic nourishment. If this one thing is taken care of, a human being is capable of organizing his own inner nature in such a way that he can live a full life. Fundamental requirement of nourishing the body, that alone must happen. Rest is all, you know, largely destructive <laughs> what we're doing in so many different ways. Now this Sanskriti evolved over a period of time where to make it a household thing so that it is not like a teaching, it is not like a philosophy, it is not an ideology or a religion but a way of living. To make this, huge efforts were made to take it to every human being. Then after some time this became known as the Hindu culture. It's very important to understand this. The word Hindu comes from this, that the land that lies between Himalayas and the Hindu Sagara is Hindu. This is a geographical identity. If you are born in this land, you are a Hindu. Whether you are a man, you are a tree, you are an earthworm, it doesn't matter. You are still a Hindu. It's like saying an elephant is born in Africa, we say it's an African elephant. If a lion is born in Africa, we say it's an African lion. So it's a Hindu earthworm because this is a geographical identity. <laughs> 
we reviewed these geographical features because these two geographical features of Himalayas and the Indian Ocean gave us the freedom to do what we want. That is, a period of eight thousand years or so, we had undisturbed life. No any kind of outside barbarians coming and attacking us, no invasions, nothing. It gave us a clear life of peacefulness. So things evolved – mathematics, astronomy, music, spirituality, all these things found the highest expression because there was no worry about uh, survival. The land was rich, the rivers were plenty, agriculture was producing enough food, enough animals around you, everything was fine. So people directed their energies inward, wanting to know the nature of our existence which is natural for a human being, once survival concerns are taken off. So when a culture lived for six to eight thousand years without concerns of survival, naturally this culture evolved inward. One thing we did was we did not take care of our military forces because we thought Himalayas and Indian Ocean is going to take care of us. That is why in great gratitude we called ourselves Hindus because Himalayas and Indian Ocean are the basis of our well-being. So in gratitude we named ourselves Hindu because these two geographical features made our life, made us who we are. Without them, we would not be who we are. So this is an expression, the word Hindu is a tremendous expression of gratitude to the mountain and the ocean between which we flourished. So this culture evolved and grew and this is not a culture, pro this is the only culture where there is a conscious effort to shape a human being. Most of the cultures evolved because of geographical compulsions or survival compulsions, they developed certain… the only goal was always mukti. Whether… <clears throat> whether you educate yourself, that's towards your mukti. You do your business, that's towards your mukti. You do your politics, that's what you… that's towards your mukti. You raise a family, that is towards your mukti. Everything else is secondary. The only and only goal is to attain your liberation. Till ra last generation probably, in day-to-day -day conversation, mukti, moksha were common words being used. Only now probably in the last thirty, forty years, it is kind of evaporated from our conversations. Uh, now we are discussing what is happening in the share market every day. <coughs> Nothing wrong but it's too narrow uh, a focus. Nothing wrong about the share market, nothing wrong about the business. Only thing is, it can only be one aspect of our life. It cannot be the complete dimension of our lives. Survival has to be taken care of. Today we have come to a place where we need a military, we need protection, we need industry, everything is fine. But this is only one dimension of life. If we do not attend to the other dimension of life, we will have everything and we'll have nothing. That will be our way. This happened in 1924. There was a, a bishop in the Greek Orthodox uh, group in Istanbul. The Greek Orthodox Christians generally consider themselves the only Christians, the others are not. And they have their own pope in Istanbul. Being on the Silk Route, so many miraculous stories from India floating across the Bosphorus, exciting their imagination about yogis, mystics and all kinds of stories. So the bishop had great urge to visit India, but being a man of cloth, he could not decide when to go where. So after he was sixty years of age, he found the opportunity to come to India. He came to southern India and uh, he found a guide. He wants to meet a yogi or a mystic. So somebody pointed out, go up this mountain in a place like this, there is a yogi, he's the right man for you. So our man went up with great trouble. Then he saw a yogi sitting in front of a cave, completely blissed out. He went and prostrated in front of him and the yogi saw all this commotion of going down and going up. Then he opened his eyes and smiled. Immediately the bishop asked, can I ask you a question? The yogi said, by all means. 
The bishop asked, what is life? This is after sixty. Okay. <laughs> you should have asked this question when you were eight, at least sixteen, sixty. But it's okay, it's better late than never. So when he asked this question, what is life? The yogi went into raptures within himself and said, Oh, life, life is like the fragrance of jasmine upon gentle spring breeze. The bishop looked like this and said, What? Life is like fragrance of jasmine upon gentle spring breeze? My teacher told me, life is like a thorn. Once it gets into you, if you sit it hurts, if you stand it hurts, if you lie down it hurts. <laughs> and you are saying it's like fragrance of jasmine upon gentle spring breeze. How is this? The yogi smiled and said, well, that's his life. Now, <laughs> what I'm telling you is, this is a land where always you have been told, your life is your karma. Yes? <coughs> now people have invented this. Karma means it's something that drops from somewhere. No. Karma means action. Whose action? Our action. So it is just what we do. In terms of action does not mean just what we do in the world. Every moment as you sit here, in wakefulness and in sleep, there are four types of actions happening within you all the time. Physical action, mental action, emotional action and energy action. Happening every moment of your life, whether you're awake or asleep, it's happening. The residual impact of this activity is forming itself into certain tendencies for which traditionally they have used a most appropriate word called vasana. Vasana means literally a smell. So let's say today in the garbage bin there is rotten fish, certain kind of creatures will go for it. Tomorrow there are temple flowers in it, certain other kinds of creatures will go for it. This is how it is. If you develop a certain amount of karmic substance, uh, you will develop a certain kind of tendency or vasana, accordingly life comes towards you and you go towards it. These are tendencies which are being unconsciously created by you. This is your making. Because more than ninety-nine percent of your physical, mental, emotional and energy action is unconscious, it looks like it's being done to you. But this is your making. Every point they told you, this is your karma. This means this is your making. But then how do I perform my action? How should I keep my thoughts? How do I keep my emotions? What should I do? I'm sure every one of you have tried in some way or the other, but the nature of the mind is such, if you say, I don't want something, only that will happen. Yes? We can do an experiment right now. Next ten seconds, nobody should think of a monkey. Close your eyes and try this. Only monkeys, isn't it? Because the nature of the mind is like this, because the nature of the mind is such, you cannot do anything forcefully with it. Whatever you do, only addition and multiplication will happen. Subtraction and division is not possible in your mind. Try whatever, multiplication will happen. No reduction of thoughts will happen, isn't it so? Yes? Because this is the nature of the mind. This is not shaped by your forceful will. This is shaped by creating a conducive atmosphere within you. When I say a conducive atmosphere within you, we glean from nature what are the laws which rule our life. We have heard of… in modern science you have heard of laws, laws of gravity, laws of motion. These are something that people observed. Somebody observed that an apple falls only down and not up, it's not a discovery, everybody knew that's how it is. But why does it fall down? Why it only falls this way? That is… leads to law of gravity or whatever. 
So what we call as loss are ob keen observations as to under what loss physical dimension of life happens, this is the interest of modern science. The interest of mystical dimensions or the spiritual sciences have always been what are the laws which govern the inner nature? What is it that makes a particular human being the way he is? And another may be born in the same house to the same parents and why is he completely in a different way? Two children born to the same parents, same food, same school, do you see how diametrically opposite they may be growing? So what is it that governs the inner nature? So by keen observation, we came to the laws which group, which govern the subjective nature of the human being. From this, we formulated certain laws which we called as dharma. Dharma means a law. Dharma mean, does not mean a religion. Dharma does not mean a belief system. Does not, dharma does not mean looking up or looking down. Dharma means we have understood the laws of nature. As there is a law for physical nature, there is a law for the inner nature. Understanding this loss, how well you understand a particular law will give you that much of freedom and latitude as to what you can do with your life. Right now, we can fly airplanes not because we are going against gravity, because we have understood gravity very well. That's why we are flying. It is not counter to the gravity. It is a deeper understanding of gravity which allows us to fly. Similarly with inner nature, as you understand the lo laws that govern the inner nature, the subjectivity of the human being or the mechanics of what it means to be human, as you understand this deeper and deeper, as your realization deepens, it allows you more and more freedom. When you have perfection of dharma within you, you attain to absolute freedom which is called mukti or moksha.